There's a picture that one of my friends had on his Facebook page that was this epic arm wrestling match between Satan and Jesus. They were both straining heavily against each other as they tried to push each other's arm down to the table. I'll tell you the problem I have with that picture in a second, but first let's play the opposite game. I'll say a word, you say the opposite. Up. Good. Light. God. Okay, now on that last one, there's a good chance you said Satan or the devil is God's opposite. I don't blame you, I did the same thing. The problem is, it's wrong. God has no opposite. To say that God has an opposite infers that there is an equal opposing force to God, which is impossible. God has no equal. God has no opposite. There's none like our God. I hated the arm wrestling picture because it's unbiblical. Satan's a master marketer. He's convinced the world of two things. He doesn't exist beyond myths and legends, or if he does, he's as strong as God. In the church world, he's convinced many Christians that he's either a little whispering imp on your shoulder with no real power, or a massive goat-hooved all-powerful beast who rivals the strength of God not to be messed with. Both are wrong. He's managed to penetrate almost every culture in some form. In the West, he appears in so many myths, legends, and folk stories in so many guises that the true biblical description of him has become obscured even in the minds of those who have read it. Usually, he's seen as a dark, maniacal monster dressed in red with horns and a pitchfork, pointed tail, bent on destroying and corrupting everything he can. He's almost universally thought of as the embodiment of all that's evil. This perception of Satan should disturb us because by viewing him as the ultimate evil, we've given him far greater stature than he deserves. Now, this session's not to glorify his strength or his cleverness, but the more we understand about him and the way that he operates, the more effective and courageous we'll be as we fight him. So, where did Satan come from? Satan was created as an angel, one of the sons of God. He was the most powerful and beautiful angel in heaven. Some believe he was the worship leader of heaven. His beauty would have been incomprehensible to our feeble minds, but he's not a god. He was created and created to serve God. Because of his power and beauty, his heart was filled with pride, and he believed that he should be on the throne of heaven. He started a rebellion and a war in heaven to take the throne and was cast out of heaven to the earth with a third of the angels who followed him. All good was stripped from these angels and now they're called fallen angels, unclean spirits, devils, or demons. So if Satan began as an angel, we should study angels a bit to understand them better. Angels were made before the creation of the world. They were created to serve and worship God, their servants and helpers to humanity. Interesting note, Satan was created to serve man. There are different ranking angels. We see in scripture that Michael is referred to as the archangel, a title that indicated rule and authority over other angels. The cherubim are high ranking angels, indescribable in power and beauty. A cherubim drew his sword and protected the entrance to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were cast out. Two cherubim are carved over top of the Ark of the Covenant. God is enthroned between them. Another class of angels is seraphim. The prophet Isaiah tells us that the seraphim are six-winged fiery angels who surround God as he sits upon his throne and who worship God continually. The seraphim also minister to the Lord and serve as his agents of purification as demonstrated by their cleansing of Isaiah's sins before he began his prophetic ministry. We know that if angels have different ranks, then so do demons. Satan's ranks are highly organized and active in different regions, industries, and they have different functions. Next, there are too many angels to be counted. Angels have proper names. Three names of angels we have in the Bible are Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer, who became Satan. They have personal character. They feel, they rejoice, they praise, they defend. Angels can materialize and take on bodily form. So what happened to Lucifer, or Satan, as he's called now? Here's a description of Satan from Ezekiel 28. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Carmelian, chrysolite, an emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis, lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways, from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. 
Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the Mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Isaiah 14, 12 says, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. And what we learn here is the pride that filled Satan's heart consists of five I will statements. Number one, I will ascend into heaven and occupy the throne of God. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, meaning I will take over as ruler of heaven. Number three, I will sit on the mount of the congregation, meaning I will receive worship from others. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, meaning he will rule over creation. Number five, I will be like the Most High. This is God's title as possessor of heaven and earth. The result of this pride, Jesus says in Luke 10, I beheld Satan falling as lightning from heaven. That was his reward for his pride. So how many angels fell with him in the rebellion? Revelation 12 says that his tail swept a third of the angels into rebellion. Considering the number of angels created, which is countless, that's a lot of demons active in the world today. Many are roaming and working throughout the earth, but some have been locked up in eternal chains according to Jude and Peter. Some are temporarily bound, cast into the pit, and will be loosed on the earth in the end times. The good news is, whether they're bound or free, they're doomed to hell forever. In fact, Satan is not the ruler of hell. That's another rumor that he started. Hell was actually created for Satan and his angels as their eternal punishment. So if you're following Satan, you'll ultimately follow him to his eternal destination. Allow Christ to save you from this fate and trust in his finished work and find forgiveness at the cross. So what is Satan like now that he has fallen? Let's look at the names that the Bible uses to reveal his character. Number one, Satan. This is a Hebrew word that means adversary or opposer. He opposes God, God's holy angels, and God's people. Number two, the devil. Diabolos, one who slanders and one who trips up. He slanders God, Jesus, doctrine, the church, the Holy Spirit, Christians, and everything in God's kingdom. If you're a gossip or slanderer, you're actually helping Satan in his work. So you should stop now. Number three, the serpent. Craftiness, subtlety, sneaky, wily, deceitful, deceiving. Number four, the great dragon. A powerful and destructive beast. Number five, roaring lion. A lion only roars when they've caught their prey. They don't roar when they're chasing or stalking their prey. They're sneaky. Satan's desire is to capture men and engulf them in their sin, swallowing them up. Number six, the father of lies. Lying is Satan's native tongue. Number seven, the evil one or the wicked one. He is the personification of evil, not just corrupted, but corrupting everyone around him. Number eight, the tempter. He entices men to evil, including tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Number nine, the accuser. Satan accuses us constantly before the Lord, but Jesus is our advocate. He defends us. Romans eight says nobody can lay any accusations against the Lord's elect. Number 10, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. This means the ruler of the unsaved. Now, some interesting personal names of Satan found in scripture are the anointed cherub that covers, meaning a high-ranking angel, the prince of this world, the god of this age, the prince of the power of the air, the prince of demons, and Beelzebub, which means lord of the flies, which is symbolic of death and decay. He's also called a murderer and a liar. Now, some of Satan's strategies. The first time we see Satan named in Scripture is in 1 Chronicles 21. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. 
He rose up against God's people and tempted their leader into sin. This is a repeat of the Garden of Eden. He rose up against God's people in the Garden and tempted them to sin as well. Satan has no new strategies because the same old stuff keeps working. It sounds sad, but it's actually good news because if we know his plans, then we can fight more effectively against them. Ephesians 5.11 says, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. We often get so wound up in Satan's overt work that we miss his covert work. His overt work is the stuff that's obvious to see. Things like murders, abuse, corruption, poverty, addiction. The covert work is the stuff that's not so obvious, which makes it way more dangerous. It's easy for a nation to see the enemy coming with tanks and guns, but it's way harder to guard itself against the spy who has embedded himself in a high position of trust and influence. Satan's sneakiest strategy is taking something that's part truth and part lie. When something looks true and makes sense, it's hard to see the deception within. An example of this is false religions. All religions are similar based on serving a God and doing good to others. Well, what's wrong with that? There's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. If you remove Him, all that remains is empty rituals with no saving power. Most people won't listen to death metal music, but you may get caught up in your local Top 40 station with catchy songs about sex, drugs, and money. Remember, Satan comes as an angel of light to deceive us. He doesn't come as a scary monster because we'll see him coming and reject him. He's way too smart for that. It's way more dangerous to have a man in a pulpit denying biblical doctrine than it is to have a witchcraft seance. Satan's choice man is not necessarily a Satanist, a witch, or a murderer. It's a good-looking person who does good things and denies Jesus. 1 Timothy 4 says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith, overt work, and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons, covert work. Titus 1.9 says, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it's been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Satan also has some recycled lies that he's been using since the beginning. In Genesis, he tempts Adam and Eve by arguing that God is a cosmic killjoy and doesn't want them to have fun or have knowledge. He also makes them doubt what they heard from God. Did God really say, don't eat the fruit? He did it to Jesus after Jesus' 40-day fast. Jesus rebuked him with scripture used in proper context, and Satan couldn't win. Satan's an oppressor and loves to see people in bondage to sin. He's a perverter. He takes what God made for good and uses it for evil. Food is good, but can be used for gluttony. Sex is good, but is used for evil. Money isn't evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. And lastly, Satan is an imitator. He doesn't have any new ideas. It's the same temptations, same lies, and false imitations of God's good work. Look at 2 Corinthians 11.13. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Satan has his own team of false pastors, prophets, and teachers. Everything that God has created for good, Satan has the evil imitation. What makes this dangerous is 99% truth mixed with 1% falsehood. It can easily lead astray those who are weak in their faith. Think about a glass of water with one drop of cyanide in it. Mostly good, but ultimately deadly. A friend of mine in New York, John Ramirez, who I did a testimony film on a few years back, ex-Satanist and was in some heavy witchcraft, and he told us how he used to heal people uh, using demonic forces. What he would do was send evil spirits against people and things would start going wrong or they'd get sick or have weird things happening in their lives. And they'd come to John and have him do a cleansing of them and give them healing. And so he'd do a little ritual and ask the demons to come off of these people and the people would go away healed. And then John later on would send those demons back and they'd come and pay more money to get another healing. What's so dangerous about this is it deceives people and keeps them from finding true healing in Jesus Christ. So what can Satan do to people? Well, besides lies and imitations, Scripture reveals that he can cause such things as sickness, mutinous, blindness, mental illness, disease, physical disability, supernatural strength, curses, and bodily possession. The good news is that whatever he has caused, Jesus can heal. Let's look at the major differences between Satan and God. Satan is not self-existent. He was created and without God cannot exist. He's a creature who is supremely inferior to God. God's the only uncreated one. 
Next, Satan's not sovereign. He rules a kingdom of darkness and demons, but not beyond what God has allowed him. Satan has never cast off the government of God. The rebellion totally failed. If you want to think of him properly, think of him as in exile. He's been exiled to the earth. He hasn't shaken off the chains of God, but is in rebellion to them. The book of Job shows us that he has to present himself before God and has many boundaries. God uses Satan to his own ends. Satan's not omnipotent. This means he is not all-powerful. Powerful, but not all-powerful. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Next, Satan is not omniscient. This means that he does not know everything. There's no statement in the Bible that backs up the view that he knows the future or can even read the thoughts of men. The Bible states that angels desire to look into the matter of salvation. They don't understand everything. If Satan was omniscient, he'd never let Jesus go to the cross. Next, Satan's not omnipresent, which means he's not everywhere at once. He's limited like us to be in one place at one time. He's well organized and has his demonic forces working around the world, but he can't be in more than one place at a time. The devil has fooled millions, including us oftentimes. But the good news is that Jesus sees all, knows all, and has never been fooled. The Bible's clear that Satan cannot hold a position of strength and opposition against God. Darkness isn't the opposite of light, it's the absence of light. The mere presence of light eliminates the darkness. Bad's not so much the opposite of good, but the absence of good. Romans 12 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We overcome evil with good. It's not a question of balance. Satan's not equal to God. He's a created being who cannot be compared to God and even relies on God for his own existence. He's corrupted and defeated. His inheritance, his judgment, his fate, his destination is hell, and nothing will ever change this or stop it. Revelation 20 says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, if you're not a born-again follower of Christ, you're actually under Satan's authority. There are only two kingdoms. Satan's been defeated at the cross, and your freedom from Satan's power is only found at the cross of Christ. Turn from your sins. Trust in Jesus' forgiveness at the cross. For those in Christ, Jesus has claimed the victory on our behalf. We will overcome all the power of the enemy. Luke 10, 19 says, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. All right, so now we understand the power and more importantly, the limitations of Satan, that he's not equal to God. He's not even equal to us. We have greater authority and power. Next, we're gonna go a little deeper in what our authority and identity is in Jesus Christ and how that gives us power over the enemy and why our identity and how we see ourselves in Christ is so important.